we have our scripture reading today, which is from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 13 to 20. And it reads, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, I'm wondering about something. Yes, Caesarea Philippi, the, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered Jonah, answered uh, him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock you are. You, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound on, in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Please pray with me. Dear God, we thank you for this invitation to come up close and personal to know you and to be known by you. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart and all of our hearts be acceptable to you and glorifying to your name. Amen. Almost 24 years ago, I went to the United Methodist church board of ordained ministry to be interviewed which is like an after you write your papers you have this oral examination by a dozen or so clergy and laity i was about to complete my master's in divinity and i was going through the process of ordination so in the first phase i was to be um, commissioned and after two or three years you get to apply for ordination. And this period of time is called probationary membership, which is another way of saying, can you handle ministry? <laughs> so after the first question, which is usually a softball question, like share the joy of ministry or what have you done lately that brings you joy? Something innocuous, you know, something fun. So, but then the sink in the meat questioning begins right after that. And one of the questions that they asked me to this was to describe Jesus. They told me, who is Jesus? So I thought I was going to impress the committee by quoting them from Isaiah 9, 6, which tells of Jesus coming to us as the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And I continue to describe Jesus as the incarnate, incarnate God, um, one from God. And, and I'm giving them this whole exegesis of the text of from John 1, how God, how Jesus is the Word, and the Word was God, and, and the Word was from the, you know, from the beginning, and on and on and on. After some monologue of what I thought was superbly impressive, I noticed that all of the 12 people who sat in a semicircle had this glazed over look. It didn't take me long to realize I had lost them. I tried a different tactic. 
I started telling them all the poetic descriptions from the Gospels. The Good Shepherd, the Bread of Life, the Living Water, the Way, the Truth, and the Life. And one of the older clergymen kind of went, <coughs> and waved his hand to tell me, stop, stop, stop. He then put his elbows on his knees, leaned over, fixed his eyes on me, and asked, how would you describe Jesus to a five-year-old? What? I froze. I didn't go to seminary for four years and had loads of loans to be asked this question. I was most comfortable theologizing with all the church jargon, but now they wanted me to tell them what I would tell the five-year-old who Jesus is. So I said, as I sat there wishing that I was anywhere else in the world, I realized why I froze. The members of the committee became a blur, and instead I imagined Jesus sitting in their midst asking me, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Not what the Bible says, not what the theologians whom you spent reading late into the night say, not what you think you have to say to impress these clergy and laity who are deciding your future. Who is Jesus to me? I sat there and I thought, to a five-year-old, in one sentence, who is Jesus to me? And the answer was clear and loud. Jesus is my best friend for life. For the first time since I began giving them a theologically laden answer, they all smiled. They all smiled. And I like to believe that Jesus smiled as well. Who do you say Jesus is to you? Sit there for a while to ponder this question. Don't answer it too quickly. It's not meant to be answered quickly. We Christians have been educated. Yes, educated to know Jesus as if we will memorize the multiplication table. As children, we are taught to memorize the Lord's Prayer. During confirmation class, we are taught to memorize the Apostles' Creed. We memorize the golden rule and repeat them as if they were a badge of honor. Also, this question can be foreign to some of us. It is not something that we ponder and think about as if there, was, there is nothing better to do with our busy lives. So sit there for a short time and listen as Jesus asks you, who do you say I am? And don't worry, you don't have to answer it out loud. There's no committee waiting for an answer. This is between you and Jesus. Today's gospel's narrative takes place in a beautiful seaside called Caesarea Philippi. It is not just a bustling seaport back then as it is today, but it was a place where many ancient shrines and statues of pagan gods were found. It is in the midst of all these idols that Jesus' messiahship is proclaimed the true God. The disciples have been on a mission working, going town to town to do the work that Jesus has sent them to do. Heal the sick, bring comfort to the afflicted, and good news to the hopeless. There have been much talk about who he was. There have been 
in town squares and in the temples of the elites and in the homes of ordinary people. And they were all wondering about who this Jesus is. Jesus wants to know, who do people say that I am? What's the word out there in town? The disciples' answers are, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say that you are Elijah. Others are saying that you are one of the prophets. And you know, they're all pretty good answers. They see Jesus as a prophetic figure, someone who comes before and prepares everybody for the big event, for the salvation of the Jewish nation. I can almost feel the disciples' excitement. They had come back from a successful ministry, a mission trip to remember. Miracles took place, just as Jesus told them it would. Now they're excited to share the word out in the streets and in the homes. They all speak out eagerly, eagerly to be the one that gives the right answer. Yet Jesus is not interested in what others are saying about him. It is interesting that he doesn't confirm nor correct. He just listens to them. He allows the disciples to share the opinions of others. He allows them to form their own opinions. And I love this section. I really am glad that we have this section of the story because I see it as representing our own attempts at figuring out Jesus. Do you have an answer? Who do you say Jesus is to you? Not the pastor, not what the bishop said, not the district superintendent, not the church leaders, but you. I love this portion of Jesus allowing the disciples to figure out who Jesus is from what they have learned from their travels and from what people have been saying. For that is what we do day in day out. We live out the question of who Jesus is depending on what is going on in our lives as well as in the world. And Jesus can fill in different roles for us at different times. Sometimes he's a parent, sometimes he's a teacher, sometimes he's a healer, sometimes as a guardian, sometimes as a kind of loving disciplinarian. So answering the question, who do you say I am, is not a destination, but a journey. So the question turned personal at this time. Jesus turns the tables from what others are saying to what the disciples believe. What others are saying is impersonal. Repeating their opinions is not intimate. It is objective and distant. At this point, the question who Jesus is becomes personal. How have I touched your hearts through the ups and downs of our journey together? What meanings have you have attached to the laughter and the tears that we have shared the last three years? Have you felt the love when we eat together and care for each other? Who am I to you? We don't read how the disciples reacted to this question. Matthew does not elaborate. But I think we can probably imagine the awkward silence the side glances of the students who don't want to have eye contact with the teachers lest they be called out. Did anyone excuse himself for a bathroom break? Did they shuffle their feet as they would like to make a hole deep enough to hide their heads like ostriches? Did they wish that somebody else would speak up to break the silence? And someone does. Guess who? Peter. Peter 
with all the background surrounding Caesarea Philippi, with all these false idols and statues, statues of old and forgotten gods, he proclaims the true identity of Jesus, saying, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And for his bold testimony, Peter, whose name in the Greek is Petros, which sounds very much like the word rock, Petros, is told that on this rock I will build my church. How Peter was able to formulate this divine answer could be because of his journey with Jesus the past three years. He was called from fishing for fish to a new vocation of sharing the good news of God. Jesus healed his mother-in-law when she was sick. Jesus took him to the mountain where he witnessed Jesus' radiant divinity known as the transfiguration. Peter got to walk on the water. Peter was saved from drowning. So all these past experiences and more should have helped him realize how close Jesus is to Peter. But Jesus also makes it clear that the divine revelation was not something that came out of Peter, but it was a revelation done by the Father through the Holy Spirit. Peter's relationship with Jesus will get even more murky, confused, and closer. Jesus warned Peter that he will deny him three times. And Peter said, no way, no way. That will never happen, Jesus. But it did. Still, Jesus looked him in the eye with tenderness and pity. After the resurrection, Jesus made up with Peter and cooked him fish for breakfast as Peter labored towards shore. Thus, up close and personal. This is a caring relationship. After Jesus left to go to the Father, it was Jesus who sent the Holy Spirit to empower Peter to preach on Pentecost so that 3,000 plus individuals came to Christ in the beginning of the church. Jesus' promises to be with the disciples through the Holy Spirit to the ends of time is what gave him the courage to suffer through persecution and even martyrdom. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I believe that the Holy Spirit continues to mold us, shape us, as we grow in the knowledge of Jesus the Christ. Not just as a distant deity who is impersonal, but someone who wants to draw us closer to Jesus so that you and I and Jesus can become up close and personal. Jesus comes to us asking us the same question. Who do you, 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 and I say Jesus is to us? How do you see me, Jesus asks, in your life? Friends, this, this is a question that comes to us because Jesus is a relational God who desires to have an up-close and personal relationship with us. Jesus is not of our religion. Let me repeat this again. Jesus was never about religion, but he's all about relationship. And for that reason, we are to ponder this intimate question every day for a lifetime. When I first started thinking about this sermon and wondered about Proding and probing and pointing out this particular question to you and making it personal. There was a part of me that said, you're going to lose the audience. Because not all of us want to think about that. 
Not all of us are comfortable sitting there thinking, who is Jesus to me? Do I even have an idea? Even the faintest idea? I knew that you would not get everybody's attention. Like I lost the committee on the Word Over Day ministry in the first few minutes. But the question is right on that Bible. And we are to take it in and ask that question every day for a lifetime as we grow and withdraw and come back and grow and doubt and withdraw and come back and grow to love and to serve. Because God cares that Jesus is part of who we are. Even in our most difficult and doubtful times, Jesus desires to enter in, be up close, and be personal. It is in the most difficult of times when Jesus wants us to know that he's ever present. It is in the most festive situations that Jesus wants to be part of the celebration as well. Grow closer to Jesus so that we may have a more intimate and personal relationship through the power of the Holy Spirit. What we do here is not about religion. It's about relationship with each other and with God so that we may take our blessing into the world and to share with others who Jesus is for us. Knowing about God and knowing God are two very different things. You can know about God all you want and never make Jesus a personal savior. And you know, it is okay to admit, to admit that we don't have the answer right now, right here. We may not have it tomorrow or the, even the day after. Many of the disciples did not even get a clear picture until after the resurrection. Not knowing or being unsure is fine. Yet Jesus still invites us and wants to come into our hearts and lives to show us how good he is, how patient he is, how inviting he is. Seek the Holy Spirit every day to draw closer to Jesus and become up close and personal. God and Jesus, all the things that the Bible, the Sunday school teachers, the creed, the preachers have said that he is, is true. But I am confident to say that Jesus will be much more content when we can say to Jesus who he is personally to us, how he touches us intimately, and what you can do to draw closer to Jesus. As I got a smile from the committee with my very simple but sincere answer to who Jesus is for me, he is my best friend for life. We may even get a smile out of Jesus with our deep, up close and personal answer of who Jesus is. With our transparency, with our ability to say, I still don't know yet, but I trust that I can learn more and know you, God, not about God, but know God for who he is. And make that personal to you. And I know that when we say that, we will get a smile from Jesus as well. I'm pretty sure that we will get a smile. Let it be so. Amen.